We've been studying the life of Jonah. In case you missed a week, I want to quickly catch you up. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go. So he disobeyed God, got on a boat, and headed as far as he could in the opposite direction. The ship got caught in a storm sent by God. The sailors figured out Jonah was the reason for the storm and threw him overboard. God sent a fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah discovered you can run and run and run and run, but you can't outrun God. In the belly of the fish, God got Jonah's attention. Jonah spent three days in the fish praying, learning, committing, and deciding. And finally, the fish threw up Jonah on the shore. And no surprise, now Jonah was ready to obey God. In fact, after his experience, you expect Jonah to be immediately obedient to God for the rest of his life. We pick up the story in Jonah chapter 3, the highlight verse of the book. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. That's where we finished last week with this powerful truth. Regardless of where you've been or what you've done, God still has a plan for your life. What a moment it must have been. After his stunning disobedience, Jonah had to wonder if God would ever use him again. God's assignment for Jonah hadn't changed. Jonah got a second chance. God said to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And what happened to Jonah will happen to you. When you've been disobedient, God will take you back to that point of disobedience with another opportunity to obey. Learn from your mistakes. Always take advantage of second chances. Remember, blessing follows obedience. And the second time, Jonah's response was different. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. And you better believe he did. No doubts, no questions. Jonah immediately headed to Nineveh. It wasn't an easy trip. Jonah walked five to 600 miles, about the distance from this building to Indianapolis, Indiana. Let's say Jonah was an elite athlete in tip-top shape who was able to cover 25 miles a day, which isn't likely after what he just went through. If he was, the journey took at least a month. More likely, the, Jonah, the journey took Jonah over two months on dirt roads and dusty, rocky paths. The long walk was another opportunity for Jonah to think back through his decisions and the consequences. It was a long, lonely time of prayer and reflection. After two months alone with God, you expect a very different Jonah. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. In other words, a big city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. No, no friendly introduction, no fun video or fast song, just a direct, very confrontational message. You've got 40 days, or God's going to destroy you. I would not recommend you do that at the Olive Garden. <laughs> Everybody listen up, pay attention. In 40 days, this will be gone Unless you repent and turn to God, no more surprisingly tasty bread sticks for you, you sinners. <laughs> that is not how preachers are taught. If I tried that with you, even after almost 30 years of relationship, this wouldn't go well. But in Jonah's case, the response was amazing. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Now, sackcloth is not really something we do today. To help you understand, here's a modern-day equivalent. The British royal family has very strict rules for dress in public. Everyone travels with a black outfit in case it's necessary to attend a state funeral. If you see a member of the royal family in public wearing black, you can be sure someone died. You don't have to see the funeral. All you have to do is see that they're wearing black. It is a visual cue to what's happening. Sackcloth and ashes were the same kind of visual cue. If you saw the king of Nineveh in sackcloth and ashes, you immediately knew he was in a state of mourning and repentance. Everyone knew 
the king had repented. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so we won't perish. It was an incredible move of God. This would be like if Congress and the president and all of the leaders of our nation all got saved and they went on TV and said, we're in trouble as a nation. Our only hope is the grace of God. We call on Americans everywhere to stop everything and pray. And revival broke out in our country. The Ninevites were wicked people who worshiped idols. They were not the kind of people you expect to turn to God. You've got people in your family, or at work, or at school, who are like Ninevites. You can't imagine them ever responding to Jesus. Your thought is, I know no one is beyond God's love or grace, but is there is no way that they will ever listen or decide to follow. But you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. God is constantly at work, moving in the hearts and lives of people to make them ready for him. The person in your life you think is least likely to respond may actually be the most ready to respond to the good news. You could speak something simple to them and see them give their hearts to Jesus. See, God never said, go figure out who's open and who's receptive. Identify the ready and share. Instead, God said, go tell people about me. Share your faith. I'm preparing hearts. I know how to take the hearts of even the most wicked person and prepare them for the truth of the gospel. Your job is to be obedient. The results are not in your hands. They're in God's hands. I learned that long ago when I first started. I'd give people a chance to accept Jesus, and I'd feel like a failure if no one responded. That's not on me. My job is just to give them the opportunity. The response in Nineveh, unbelievable. Jonah said, you got 40 days. And the people said, we don't need 40 days. We're ready right now. It's interesting. It took God longer to get his servant to obey than it did for an entire wicked city to repent. And I'm afraid that's often still the case. Wes Hawkins wrote, it takes longer to get Christians right than it does to get sinners to repent. Jonah announced God was going to judge them, and revival broke out. The Ninevites believed in the one true God and repented. They did away with evil and with their sin. The entire pagan city fell to its knees in acceptance, and a nation turned to God. And I say, God, do it again. Do whatever it takes to get people ready. Shake our circumstances. Make things uncomfortable. Let your people obediently move out and speak truth. Send revival and repentance to our city, to our nation. If God did it once, God can do it again. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their wicked ways, he had compassion and he did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And once again, He's the God of the second chance. God gave Jonah a second chance, and now he gave Nineveh a second chance. There's a lesson in this. Never quit on someone God's giving a second chance. I've got a grid for you. This will help you figure out if God's given up on somebody. Do they have a pulse? Are they breathing? If so, God hasn't given up. Never give up on people that God hasn't given up. Your grieving heart Been praying for the day that you'll see Someone you love come back to me But it seems so far away But don't you give up hope The answers are not always easy But there's never been a soul running That could be beyond my reach You just trust in the hand of your Savior 
Cause I'm the one who is able to see Every lost soul that's hiding And I never stop fighting So don't you stop trusting in me Cause I'm everything you need Way to keep disaster from standing at your door. Your fears call you out like a great accuser, a liar and abuser. So don't listen to him no more. Oh no, you just trust in the head of your savior. Cause I'm the one who Every lost soul that's hiding And I'll never stop fighting So don't you stop trusting in me I've got everything you need I've got everything you need Oh, when there's a better day it's coming down the road So don't you stop believing Don't you give up hope oh, There's a better day Oh, it's coming down the road So don't you stop believing Child, don't you give up hope Oh, there's a better day It's coming down the road so don't you stop believing Oh, don't you give up hope There's a better day Coming down the road Don't you stop believing Don't you give up hope You just trust in the hand of your Savior Every lost soul that's hiding And I never stop fighting So don't you stop trusting in me I've got everything you need Oh, everything you need Oh, I'm everything I'm everything you need Everything you need Some of you have somebody you've been praying for for years. Don't give up hope. God could be preparing their hearts. Your job is to share. And now the story takes a surprising unexpected and sad turn chapter 4 verse 1 but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry what you gotta be kidding me Jonah's message was successful the spirit of God fell on the city everyone repented and that made Jonah mad he prayed to the Lord Lord is this not what I said when I was still at home this is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew you were gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew you would have mercy on the stinking Ninevites. I knew you weren't going to destroy them. These people should die, but you're going to save them. You saved me, by the way, thanks for that, but you shouldn't save them. Not those people. God, you are too nice. You are too kind. People repent and you change your mind. People deserve punishment. Instead, you gave them grace. I cannot believe you overlooked their sin. This is why I ran in the first place. Ouch. 
And right here we discover the real reason Jonah disobeyed and ran from God. It wasn't fear. It was prejudice. Jonah's prejudice against the Ninevites was so strong that it blinded him to the grace he himself had received. Prejudice is an ugly, hateful, bitter sin that grieves the heart of God. Prejudice blinds you to the love God has for those around you. A prejudiced Christian, if there is such a thing, and I'm not sure there is, disqualifies others from the very grace that saved them. They're like Jonah. And Jonah didn't want Ninevites to be saved. I wonder, are there people you don't think qualify for God's grace? Maybe Muslims, Hindus, uh, Democrats, Republicans. Um, homosexuals. Abusers. Addicts. White supremacists. That's a hard word to write. I'll just trust you that somewhere you think I was somewhere right there. <laughs> Sex offenders. It, it might just be that one specific person you have in mind, your enemy. We draw boundaries around God's grace. There's me. And then we decide God's grace, it covers me, and I think it also covers Hindus and Muslims because, like, they never really had a chance because of the way they were raised. But Democrats? No, there's no such thing as a Christian Democrat. Republicans? Mm, I don't think so. There's not Christian Republicans. I think we're afraid that if we acknowledge where God draws the line, we might have to admit we're all in the same circle. See, if I include all of them, I have to admit that my sins are just as bad as their sins, that I need Jesus just as much as they do. But listen, church, this is God's heart. You say, come on, Pastor Rod, I can't be in the same circle with those people who, whose choices offend me those people are just plain wrong. See, I didn't draw that circle. God did when he so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is who Jesus died for. Jonah obeyed God, but he didn't submit to God's plan. You can act obedient and still not surrender your heart. You can do all the right things in the right places, but with a wrong heart. God doesn't just want your hands. He wants your heart. Jonah continued, and he said, Now, Lord, take away my life. It's better for me to die. I would rather die than watch these people live. In the fish, Jonah thanked God for sparing his life. Now, because God saved the Ninevites, Jonah was ready to die. That's how great his hate was. What a jerk. And the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Jonah didn't respond to God's question. Instead, Jonah went out and he sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade. And he waited to see what would happen to the city. Jonah went there to pout. He watched to see if God would 
destroy the Ninevites. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over his head to give Jonah shade to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. The average daily temperature in that area was 110 degrees. Any shade helps. Jonah was mad because Nineveh was going to be saved, but he was happy because he had a plant. A vine with big leaves that shaded him. Jonah loved his precious plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine, so it withered. Goodbye plant. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head, so he grew faint. Jonah was sitting out in the open. The wind was blowing. It felt like a microwave, and he lost his plant. Joseph was burning up. He was miserable, and he was grieving the loss of his plant. He wanted to die because he lost his plant. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Jonah was on an emotional roller coaster. When Jonah was in the belly of the whale, he prayed, I don't want to die. God saved me. And God saved him. Then when God saved the Ninevites, Jonah said, take my life. Then Jonah got a plant. And that plant made him happy. He loved his plant. But losing his plant, too much to handle. Once again, Jonah's prayer was, just kill me, God. And God said to Jonah, Hey, do you have a right to be angry about that plant? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. That's a lot of anger. Like Jonah, you get irrationally angry when the Lord removes something that he provided in the first place. And the Lord said, you've been concerned about this vine. Though you didn't tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left. That probably means children. And many cattle as well. Jonah, look at that big city. It's a big city with a lot of people and more than 100,000 kids. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And that's where the book of Jonah ends. God said, you are concerned about a vine You didn't create. It's going to be gone soon anyway. Stop. I'm concerned about a nation of people and their souls. I know you hate them, and I know you want them to die, but shouldn't I be concerned about that city? And we don't know how Jonah replied or what happened to him. We're just left to wrestle with the question. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jesus told us to go into all the world to preach the gospel to people, to be salt and light. And God could rephrase the question for us. Hey, first in alarm, I'm concerned about a generation of lost people. I'm concerned about a generation of students. I'm concerned about a generation of children. I'm concerned about a whole generation of single adults and married adults and senior adults. And you're concerned about... Surely we wouldn't be concerned about a plant, would we? Things, stuff, a style we prefer, temperature in the sanctuary, whether or not the computer works, money, face masks, our own comfort and happiness. You fill in the blanks. It's not that we don't want people to accept Jesus. It's just not our primary concern. And I'm afraid God might say to us, You're more concerned about food getting prepared right than you are the person who prepared the food. You're more concerned about how how your hair looks than the person who cut it. You're more worried about the length of the line at Walmart than you are the people in the line. You're more concerned about getting your car repaired than the guy who repaired it. You're more concerned about your flight being on time than the person next to you. You're more concerned about your cable getting stalled so you can watch the game than you are the person who installs it. You're more concerned about the policy than you are the politician and his family. You're more concerned about the post 
than the person in the profile picture. I could go on and on. We appear far more concerned about the things people do for us than the people themselves. We are concerned about how we feel rather than how they feel. We miss opportunities to share because we're focused on what we want and what we think we need. And I believe God would say to us, you're concerned about stuff that's here today and gone tomorrow. I'm concerned about the hearts and lives of women and children and students. See, you're critical of Jonah for being angry about a vine. Jonah, you're angry about a vine when a whole nation could have died and gone to hell. And God's saying, I'm concerned about a generation of unsaved people. And you're concerned about... I mean, what really bothers you? What makes you mad? I get angry about waiting. I hate lines. I hate traffic jams. Maybe God could rephrase that and say, Rod, you're angry about lines? How long you have to wait or how long it takes you? You're angry about lines? I'm angry about a generation of lost people. You get angry when you don't get your way. And God would say, really? You're concerned because you didn't get your way? They didn't sing the song you wanted? You're mad about that? I'm concerned about a bunch of people who are going to hell. You get angry when a relationship doesn't work out right. God would say, you're concerned about a relationship? I'm concerned about a generation of lost people. I watch your posts. You get angry when you get bad customer service. God says, really? That's it? That's what you're angry about? That's what you're concerned about? That's what you're taking your time and energy on? I'm concerned about a generation of people that's going to hell. You're angry about politics. And God would say to you, that's it? That's what matters to you most? Politics? You're angry about an election that didn't turn out the way you thought it should? You get mad? When you lose a politician you thought would keep you safe and comfortable? You're more mad about that than you are concerned about people who are lost and dying and going to hell. You're more like Jonah than you want to admit. I'm concerned about a nation that has turned from me. Do you see what I mean? We want to be critical of Jonah, but the very same fault in his thinking is often in mine and in yours. We justify our thinking. We deem our anger as righteous. We feel like we have to fight for justice. We have to stand for right and hold people accountable for their actions. The problem is God hasn't called us to fight political battles or to hold people accountable. God has called us to love people and to share the story of his forgiveness and his grace. God will handle the battles. God will handle justice. God will hold people accountable. Bob Goff wrote, I see myself as a follower of Jesus, not a lawyer for him. I've got a lot of confidence in the power of truth. Truth has power and doesn't need as much defense as we sometimes act like it needs. Some of you have chosen the hill you're going to die on. And there's nothing redemptive about it at all. You've staked your reputation as a person and as a follower of Jesus on something that brings him no glory. And I wonder if God doesn't look at our church and the church in America and say to us like he said to Jonah, I'm concerned about a generation of people who don't know me and you're concerned about how selfish and self-centered to have been given so much and to be blessed by God and to know God and to have a wonderful church and Christian friends and high standards and all the things we're blessed with. How selfish to have been blessed with all that and yet not feel any obligation to share it with those people. Isn't that what Jonah did? Are we equally guilty? 
One mark of spiritual maturity is the degree to which our concerns lines up with the concerns of God. The problem with Jonah and sometimes the problem with us is that our concerns don't line up with God's concerns. We're concerned about stuff that's here today and gone tomorrow. He's concerned about a whole world of people who are lost and dying and doomed to a Christless eternity because they don't know him. The question is, what are, you, what are you concerned about? And how does that line up with what God's concerned about? If your concerns and God's concerns aren't the same, maybe it's time for you to change. 